Good morning. It is uh, blown away by Anna, by uh, the worship team. Always am when I come on college campuses. So thank you for letting me enter into worship with you. December 6, 1860, Charles Thomas Studd was born. CT, as he was known to his family and friends, and he would become one of the greatest cricket players of all time. In his early 20s, at really the height of his athletic fame, he was given an evangelistic pamphlet of sorts. But this wasn't the kind of thing that you and I might hand out. This was an evangelistic pamphlet from an atheist, an atheist claiming that Christianity couldn't be true because when he looked at Christians, the way they lived didn't meet out what they said they believed was to be true. And C.T. read this and he was deeply convicted about his own life. And so he began to ask, how do I live as if the gospel is true in my own life and not fall prey to what this pamphlet said? And so he began to teach at evangelistic meetings. He actually ended up feeling so convicted about his possessions that he sold all of them and gave them away to the poor. Ultimately, he felt called to go be a missionary with the China Inland Mission, the, the missionary organization that Hudson Taylor began. And he would give his life to missions. Now, in doing so, many people tried to convince him not to go. They said, you're going to have great influence here because you are full of fame. Everybody knows who you are, CT. Why don't you stay here and use that influence for good? But he was unconvinced. And so, along with six other men, the Cambridge Seven, as they came to be known, he set sail and joined the China Inland Mission in 1885. Not long after he was there, CT came from a very wealthy family, and his father passed away. His father left him an inheritance that would be somewhere around $5 million today. Now, CT, instead of saying, praise God, he has provided for me so that I can be a missionary for the rest of my life. I never, ever have to ask for funds again. He became worried that he would begin trusting in his inheritance for provision instead of God. And because of this fear, he took all of that money and he gave it away. He remained in China and then moved to India for about 16 years as a missionary, all the while struggling with his health, eventually it calling him home to recover. While he was home, he began to feel called to go to the heart of Africa. Again, people tried to talk him out of going. He was sick, he was frail, he had influence at home. But he looked around him and he saw literally hundreds upon hundreds of businessmen lining up to go to the heart of Africa with the same risks because they had heard a rumor that there was gold in Africa. And CT said this, he said, if such men hear so loudly the call of gold and obey it, can it be that the ears of Christ's soldiers are deaf to the call of God and the cries of the dying souls of men? Are gamblers for gold so many and gamblers for God so few? And so he went and he lived in Africa for 18 years, dying in the heart of the Congo in July 1931, having opened the doors of missions in Africa. I don't know about you, but I love these kind of stories, but a part of me kind of hates them. I am inspired by faith like this, but then I am intimidated that my life will never measure up to somebody like C.T. Studd. I come away feeling like, will I ever be enough? So what I want to talk about this morning is I want to talk about that idea, that life of C.T. Studd, that convicting life of C.T. Studd and how it relates really to financial stewardship as worship. I believe C.T. Studd's life can teach us a lot about this topic. Before doing so, I want to define what worship is. You guys probably all have a picture in your mind about worship. What does it mean to worship? Maybe it's what we just did in singing. Maybe it's this service or a church service or kneeling in prayer. There's all kinds of expressions of worship, but worship in its most basic fundamental form is simply this. It is the human response to the self-revelation of God. When we see God rightly for who he is, our only rational, reasonable response is worship. It's, it's an outpouring of seeing God for who he actually is. Paul actually details this in great detail in his letter to the Romans. 
For 11 chapters, Paul lays out over and over and over how we are broken, how we are a sinful people, how we have no hope of being made right with God. But God, two of the greatest words in all the Bible, but God in his mercy makes a way for us. And so Paul gives us this exquisite picture of our hopelessness before a righteous God that is removed through the infinite mercy of God. And then he turns in chapter 12 to our response. He begins with the self-revelation of God and he comes to our response and he says this in the first verse of chapter 12. He says, I appeal to you therefore because of all these things, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. In the Old Testament, there were two kinds of sacrifices. There were the guilt kind of sacrifices and there were sacrifices of thanksgiving and praise. Jesus paid the price for all of our guilt sacrifices. And so Paul is appealing to us. He's inviting us to present our bodies as thanksgiving, as bodies, as sacrifices of thanksgiving and praise. Really, literally, as sacrifices of worship. Notice too, Paul isn't saying, go make a sacrifice. He's saying, go become a sacrifice. There's a huge difference between making a sacrifice and becoming a sacrifice. When I make a sacrifice, when I take a lamb, or I even take an offering, it's a one-time thing. But when I become a sacrifice, it is a total transformation of my life. It is something new. I am a new creation like we read about in 2 Corinthians 5 just a moment ago. I present myself living as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. I'm actually presenting myself to God as something entirely different that he has made in me. And Paul says, this is our worship. This is our spiritual act of worship. This is the only reasonable and rational rational response. And so as Paul sees it, worship is a change of identity. It is an entirely new way of life. It's not a couple isolated acts. It's not a couple of events that I go to and do. It is actually a wholesale change in who I am. That is what worship is. And so it ceases to be something that I do and it becomes something that I am becoming. It is who I am. I am the living sacrifice. And then Paul gives us some instructions on how we do this, how we present our bodies as living sacrifice. In uh, verse two, he says this, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Right, so, so Paul actually lays out two ways we can respond to the mercy of God. Effectively, he says you can ignore it and you can be conformed to the world. You can become deformed, if you will, into idolaters of the world. Or you can be transformed into worshipers of God, into people whose lives are worship. This word conformed is actually a word that has two senses in the Greek. It is both the middle and the passive, meaning that everything I do... Right, has a way of forming me. I am conformed by my actions, but I'm also passively conformed by the things that are around me. Unconsciously, as I consume things, the world or the environment that I am in is constantly trying to conform me to itself. It's why we all dress similarly so often in big groups of people, because I'm consuming these things around me and I'm being transformed or I'm being conformed into that image. Paul is saying effectively that our hearts, our desires and longings are in this process of being shaped and reshaped into something. Everything I do, everything that I surround myself with is forming me and orienting me toward something or toward somebody. We're all becoming something, right? You're either being conformed to the image of the world or you're being transformed into somebody who looks like Jesus. There's not a middle ground. And if we aren't intentional about the shaping of our hearts, the natural result is the passive result, which is being conformed to the world and not into worshipers of God, instead idolaters of the world. But if we want to be transformed into worshipers, Paul says, I invite you into renewing your mind. This word for transformation is a word that a lot of you are familiar with. It is the Greek word is metamorpheo, from which we get our word metamorphosis. Right, so think about a caterpillar 
changing from a caterpillar into a butterfly. It is a totally different transformation. It is something entirely new. Paul uses the same idea in the same word in 2 Corinthians 3.18, where he describes this process of becoming something new, of, of being transformed. When he says this, he says, and we all with unveiled face, right? We have a veil lifted from our face. We see clearly beholding the glory of the Lord. This is the self-revelation of God. We have seen God clearly for the first time. And when we do so, he says, we are being transformed into the same image, the image of Christ, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. We are being transformed into the image of Christ. As Christians, we are becoming people who look like Jesus Christ, the only one who perfectly embodied what it means to be a living sacrifice. Now, what's, what I love about this is that doesn't mean the same image, that we all look the same. Actually, God isn't trying to conform us into one image. God is an infinite God, and he has infinite expressions of his glory. And so he is transforming us into people who look like his son and infinite expressions uniquely responding to the grace in our lives. And we are being transformed from one degree of glory to another. There's a moment of transformation. There's a moment where we become living sacrifices, but then we live these lives where we begin to look more and more like our Savior. We begin to draw nearer and nearer to our Savior as we are transformed in step with the Holy Spirit. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit, he says. So how do we participate? How do we join in this work of the Holy Spirit and the renewing of our minds? We put ourselves, I believe, in postures and positions for him to transform our hearts, for him to transform our longings and desires. If worship is the human response to the self-revelation of God, then as I draw near to God, he promises he will draw near to me. And so as I do this, God transforms me into a person of worship. And then I see him more clearly. I see myself more clearly. And he draws me farther on and I am transformed more. And I walk more and more into his presence as he transforms me into the person he is calling me to be. And this happens through a lot of ways. The inputs that I put into my life, I have a really simple diagram to show how we are being transformed or conformed. Quite simply, the people that I surround myself with are going to form me in some way or another. The things I believe, uh, the stories that I consume and believe about why life is as it is, what am I feeding into my mind, forms me. But then also the habits that I do, the practices that I engage in form them. And each one of these things can help draw me near to God. They can help me orient my life and love towards God, or they can draw me away from God. They can draw me into the world. But the good news about all of this is that when we step into this life of transformation, the transforming work isn't our work. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. We, we participate with him as we walk into these things, but he does the transforming work, and he promises to do so when we walk into these places with him. So Dr. Summers promised that I'd talk about money, and I haven't talked a lot about money yet. <laughs> I have a little bit of time left to do so. So how does money fit into this? How does money transform or conform me? In this process of transformation, in this process of being conformed or transformed, what does money have to do with it? Well, Jesus actually tells us in the Sermon on the Mount and other places that money is is one of, if not the most powerful formative forces in our lives, either towards worship or towards the world. In Matthew 6, 19 to 21, he says this. He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But, he says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Listen to this. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus is literally saying to us, where you put your treasure, where you put your money, is what you will fall in love with. It will determine what you love the most. It will either drive your heart towards eternity and God, or it will drive you towards the world. And he says there's no other way. Two, three verses later in 624, he says, nobody, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or... He will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And Jesus tells us when our hearts grow to love money, do not miss this. 
When your heart grows to love money, you will end up hating God. You will despise him because he may come and try to take some of it from you, you think. This is the only idol that Jesus ever singles out in scripture and says you cannot serve it and me. Now certainly that is true. We cannot keep idols in our lives and serve Jesus, but this has a unique dangerousness to him and such a destructive power on how we relate to God that he throws up this huge red flashing sign and says you cannot serve it and me. So quite literally how I use my money, where I store my money will form my heart either into an idolater of the world and its things or a worshiper of Jesus who says you are more valuable than all of my things. There is not a middle ground here. I don't get to find my way through the middle. I have to choose. But what's good news about this is is money has a power of formation. So it doesn't just deform me if I misuse it. It actually can transform me into somebody who loves and values eternity, who loves and values and sees myself as a worshiper of Jesus. Everything I do. Everything I surround myself with, the people, the stories, and the habits, how I use my money will form me one way or another. Or as my father puts it, every spending decision is a spiritual decision. Every time I use money, every time I allocate my money towards something, it is moving my heart. It is moving it in one direction or another. I am making a spiritual declaration of eternal significance when I use my money. I'm choosing to align my heart towards eternity or I'm choosing to align my heart towards the world. Now, I want to offer a word of caution here. We're talking about renewing our minds, participating with the Holy Spirit in transformation and how important money is in this. And so you may be sitting there thinking, McCann's is going to go out of business. Can I ever buy a cup of coffee again? Can I buy a shirt? Can I, can I buy some shoes? Short answer, yes, you can. The danger I think that we have to be worried about on the other end of the spectrum as followers of Jesus is that in trying to work, trying to join with the work of the Holy Spirit, I will get entirely focused on doing. I will get entirely focused on looking really Christian with my money. But the point of all of this, hear me clearly here, the point of all of this isn't about doing something more or doing something great. It is about who we are becoming. It is about where my heart is falling in love with. And so the doing can help me in that process, but it is not ever the point. The Bible is very, very clear that simply doing without a heart check is a massive waste of time. It's what the Pharisees were rebuked about. It's what Jesus talked about all through the Sermon on the Mount. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 13, 3. He says, if I give away all that I have, If I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. I can be just like C.T. Studd. I can give it all away. I can even go and die as a martyr. But if I do it out of obligation and duty, it is meaningless. I am trying to earn my way to God, and he says that is an affront to the cross. This is my testimony. I grew up in a household that taught the principles of money management. I did it right from the time I was weaned. But I realized when I was in my 30s how empty these acts were in my life because they were simply duty. I had never beheld Christ. How many of you, I don't want to ask for hands, but I bet many of you were raised in Christian homes. And you probably heard these amazing testimonies from people. You're like, man, if only I had a testimony like that. But you you know the good Christian words that, hey, my testimony is just as awesome as these other testimonies, right? It's it's great because I'm a sinner and Christ died for my sins. I, I lived that where I said those words, but I don't really think I believed those words, frankly, till about five or six years ago. And when I finally realized that I am a sinner 
in desperate need of God, not just a pretty good guy that probably has some sins because of Adam. I was broken, realizing how great it was that God had given me his mercy. And it is from that place that transformation comes. And it is from that place that me living out whatever principles or whatever financial things I do moves me towards. If you look at the lives of New Testament followers of Jesus, what you will see is that their financial acts of worship all flowed from an understanding of who God was and what he had done for them. Mary Magdalene, as she wastefully pours out an entire bottle of perfume, is blissfully unconcerned with anything but the worship of Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea, as he dangerously asks for the body of Jesus, is blissfully unconcerned with anything but the worship of Jesus. The Macedonian believers who foolishly give out of their extreme poverty and persecution are blissfully unconcerned with anything but the worship of Jesus. And Paul, as he recklessly throws away a comfortable, safe, religious life and enters into a life of suffering and persecution, is blissfully unconcerned with anything but the worship of Jesus. There are two truths I want you to hear this morning. One, as Paul laid out in Romans 11, in, uh, 1 through 11 in excruciating detail, we have no hope of getting to God on our own. Every single one of us has no hope of getting to God on our own. We are sinful people full of sin without any way to get to God on our own. But God in his mercy made a way, right? But then I want you to hear this even more so. God loves you right now. Just as you are. Not who you will be 10 years from now once you get it cleaned up. Not who you will be once you quit struggling with the same repetitive pattern of sin over and over and over and over again. God loves you right now. His invitation to become a living sacrifice isn't to become a lamb without blemish and then bring yourself to him. It is simply this, lay your life down right now, today. There, God knows everything you have ever done and he knows everything you will ever do. And he still came and died on the cross for you. Will you grasp that truth? Don't push away and say, I'm not lovable. You are lovable because God says that you are. And his work on the cross made a way for us to come to him and offer ourselves as living sacrifices of worship in everything that we do. This isn't about you figuring out how to perform for God. This isn't about you finding the most radical, awesome, impactful thing you can do for God. Look, I'm inspired by CT Stud, and I think we need more people like that. But that's not the point. God actually has it covered. He doesn't need my money. He's not waiting for the church to start tithing so that his work can start. He has got it. But what we are lacking is people who have fallen on our knees and saying, I will give you my life. I will give you my heart. God can take five loaves or a few loaves and fishes and he can feed thousands of people. He can take the widow's might as an offering. He doesn't need your millions. He is asking for your heart in every part of your life, including your money. And so as you grow and as you learn to live a life living with money, I want you to remember that financial stewardship isn't a matter of doing the right things with money. It is about understanding how formative money is in our lives. But it's ultimately about becoming lives of worship. People who lay everything down at the foot of the cross and say, God, I have nothing but what you have given to me. I am you. 
And so I would invite each one of us to worship God as he has created us to do, to step into the transformative grace of God as we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, worshipfully responding to the grace in our lives. Let me close in prayer for us this morning. God, God, I pray that you would just overwhelm us with a sense of your mercy in our lives. You would help us to see our own sinfulness, but then more so your great mercy. Lord, let us draw near to you as a means of transformation, Lynn, and let us step into the work that the Holy Spirit has promised to do in our lives to transform us into people who look like you. God, I just pray that you would move and break hearts in this room today to trust you for the work you have done and then to become people who look like you by drawing near to you. God, we love you and thank you so much that you have called us first. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.